So welcome to this uh, panel, which is on domestic preoccupations and international uh, aspirations, a view from Russia's Arctic. And today we are so lucky to have with us uh, a couple of panelists. First, we have Alexander Sergunin, who is a professor of international relations at the St. Petersburg State University and Moscow State Institute of International Relations. Uh, and his responsibility in the GPARC project, which this conference grows out from, is the study of Russian Arctic discourse and the Russian decision-making system. And he has published three relevant articles, both in Arctic Review on Law and Politics, in the Polar Journal and uh, the journal World Economy and International Relations. Then secondly, we have uh, Helge Blackisru, who is a senior research fellow here at NUPI. He focuses on center periphery relations uh, in, uh, in Russia, including Moscow's relations with uh, the Arctic uh, region. And he, in his article to this project, he explores how Russian authorities in recent years have been trying to pool uh, various Arctic interests to facilitate a smoother policy formulation and implementation and how this is uh, uh, comes across in Russia's State Commission on the Arctic. Then third, you have me. I will be the chair. My name is Yuli Willemsen and I'm a senior research fellow here at NUPI. Uh, I do research on Russian foreign and security politics and also on the North Caucasus. And uh, my relevant contributions are a couple of articles asking whether and how the new Cold War is returning to the Arctic. So finally, we have the audience. Uh, very much welcome. You can uh, participate with questions in several ways. Some of you have sent a question uh, beforehand uh, and then you can post uh, questions in the chat. So feel free to send in the questions throughout and then we will deal with them after we have given the panelists a chance to present their views. And this session will be in three different sections. So we would be very thankful if you can post your uh, uh, questions under those three different uh, themes which we have, which I will uh, return to soon, because our topic is, as I said, uh, the view from the Arctic. So we wanted to give you just a slight bit of context uh, to remind us that Arctic, that Russia is the biggest Arctic state on most accounts. Secondly, in my readings of Russian official statements, I have found the expression that Russia's wealth in the future is going to grow from the Arctic. So that just reminds us that uh, the Arctic is an integral part of the Russian national economy. And then finally, uh, Russia's approaches to the Arctic are shaped by the very complex and changing center uh, regional relations in Russia because Russia is a vast uh, federation. So we need to keep those factors in the background when we're discussing Russia in the Arctic. And this panel will explore three questions. As I said, we'll, we will have kind of three different sections which we go through. The first question is, what are key challenges for Russia in the domestic Arctic? Secondly, how is the international circumpolar stage viewed from Moscow? What can we, and thirdly, what can we expect from Russia in the coming years in the Barents region and as an incoming chair to the Arctic Council? So we will try to move along uh, in this panel according to these three themes. Uh, and you as an audience, if you could please try to send your questions uh, uh, immediately and then first on the first theme, which is about uh, Russia's challenges in the domestic Arctic. So Helge, I will turn to you uh, first with the question, in March this year, Russia outlined 
the key principles for state policy in the Arctic until 2035. In your reading, what are these? Could you just share with us? Uh, and secondly, did you find that these priorities are rad radically changed from the years before or not? Thank you, Julia. Um, to answer the um, last question shortly first, um, I, I see a lot of continuity here. Uh, there are no radical shifts in Russia's Arctic policy as it's outlined in, in this document. And I think that reflects the fact that this is sort of a routine uh, renewal of the policy. This document replaces a, a a document, a white paper that was published back in 2008 that uh, outlined the main principles uh, and goals and interests of, of Russia uh, in the Arctic for the period uh, up to 2020. So, so this document that was published in March uh, uh, is uh, uh, a renewal um, of, of the, the old document looking forward for another 15 year period. And the main pillars of Russia's policy in the Arctic, they are the same as we have seen uh, in uh, recent years. It is, as you hinted to in your introduction, uh, the Arctic as a strategic resource base. And uh, it is also uh, uh, the fundamental role that the Northern Sea Road is, is seen to, to, to play in the future development of the Arctic. If, if we look at the, the resource base first, uh, as we all know, uh, uh, the Russian Arctic onshore and offshore uh, contains vast untapped natural resources. And uh, the role of the Arctic in Russian econom economy, it depends a little bit on how you define the Arctic, the borders of the Arctic, but usually you hear the, 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 the figures that uh, the, the Russian Arctic generates 10% uh, of the Russian GDP and some 20% of, of the exports. And, and uh, the, the new white paper or, or plans for the development of, of the Russian Arctic uh, continues to emphasize uh, uh, the development of uh, the resource base as a driver for economic growth and development in Russia uh, as a whole, not only for the Arctic region. The, the, the other uh, key element here, the Northern Sea Road, um, with the uh, climate change, uh, the melting sea, uh, uh, melting uh, sea ice, and the navigation season uh, growing longer uh, uh, in uh, uh, along the Northern Sea Road, um, this is prioritized uh, in uh, in the white paper as as uh, uh, an area for development to develop the Northern Sea Road as an international competitive uh, uh, transport corridor. And we have already seen uh, some impressive growth here in, in recent years. Last year officially uh, we ended up at more than 30 million tons being transported on the uh, or Northern Sea Road, which is uh, 430 percent increase in, in three years time and Putin had already uh, a few years back uh, declared that the goal uh, is to reach uh, a total volume of 80 million tons uh, by 2024 and with the white paper this goal was again doubled so 160 million tons uh, of cargo uh, by uh, 2035. And then, of course, we could question the realism here. Uh, uh, and I think it's also worth uh, mentioning here that this was a, uh, a document that was um, developed uh, probably last year and took some time. It was some time in the pipeline. Uh, and it was released as COVID-19 was fastening its grip on international economic development. Uh, so with uh, the economic slump that is likely to follow now, how realistic is it with uh, a development of some of the hydrocarbon resources, both when it comes to demand and prices, it's very costly to develop these uh, resources. 
how likely is it with the slump in international trade that uh, the Northern Sea Road will indeed be competitive? And uh, uh, so although there is a lot of continuity, uh, this recent white paper may actually indeed already be in need for some some adjustments. Hmm. Thank you. And I mean, with with uh, uh, the recent, should I say, beginning turmoil between people and leadership in Russia, we're very curious how successful is the way that Moscow has organized uh, center regional relations when it comes to the Arctic region? Well, there has been a lot of trial and error, I think. Uh, um, in the first years after uh, the breakup of the Soviet Union, uh, it was more or less a neglect, um, a muddling through and a scaling back of Arctic uh, governance. Uh, in the in the last decade, uh, Arctic, the, the, uh, the Russian domestic Arctic has again become a priority, and we've seen various attempts and initiatives uh, for, uh, being developed, both when it comes to how to govern the Arctic and for uh, policy initiatives to 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 kickstart uh, economic development of the region. Mm. Uh, but uh, with rather mixed results, I would say. Mm. So, for instance, when it comes to 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 governance, um, back in 2015, we we saw the establishment of a state commission for the uh, for the development of the Arctic that was supposed to, to pool uh, resources and, and gather the, the stakeholders and that that is has been the topic for my contribution to this project uh, a discussion of uh, the results that this commission have produced and I would say they are quite meager. Um, the was a second attempt to, to launch such a commission in 2009, 2018, but in 2019, the whole Arctic portfolio was moved into a, a federal ministry together with the with um, uh, Far East. So you now have a, a special ministry focusing on uh, the Far East and the Arctic, hmm. which makes uh, sense because there is an overlap. Parts of the Far East is also uh, part of the Arctic. But it also means that you have a ministry now that is supposed to coordinate development from the border with Norway at the Kola Peninsula to the border with North Korea. Hmm. Thank you. So I think we'll we'll move on now to um, Professor Sergunin. I would like uh, to ask you just simply what are uh, the mo Russia's most compelling needs uh, in its Arctic zone today? Um. Thank you, Yulia. Um, well, actually, um, uh, these needs are uh, described in detail in the same document which Helge mentioned, uh, these fundamentals of uh, our Russian strategy uh, in the uh, Arctic zone of the Russian Federation. And uh, what is interesting, uh, and uh, maybe I slightly disagree with Helge, that uh, there is no changes uh, uh, in um, uh, perceptions of the region uh, uh, among the Russian uh, political elites. No, there are some changes. First of all, uh, let me mention that uh, uh, in the previous documents, the emphasis was made on uh, development of the Arctic zone as the the resource base. But now uh, this uh, goal is more balanced with the, the goals of sustainable development. And uh, uh, in this document, the emphasis is made on the need to uh, develop sustainably this region, not only to extract uh, mineral resources, but also uh, to um, uh, take care of uh, the rational use of uh, uh, natural resources in this region. Uh, and um, um, <clears throat> Uh, it's reflected in the uh, list of priorities in this document and the list of um, uh, threat perceptions and challenges which are listed there. Remarkably also that uh, the military uh, uh, challenges, they are put in the section on challenges, not threats. So Russia does not see any uh, serious military threat uh, or security threat in the hard sense uh, in this region. Uh, military challenges are put just on the bottom of the uh, list of challenges. While, uh, for example, uh, uh, the uh, socio-economic and demographic problems uh, are moved to the top uh, of the priority list. If you look at the list of threats, uh, 
uh, we can see that uh, the major threat is uh, uh, the depopulation of the uh, Russian Arctic demographic problem. Uh, in spite of the measures which the Russian government um, was taken recently uh, to improve the living conditions in the region, the uh, outflow of the population from the region continues. Uh, this is a very serious concern uh, for, the, for Moscow, for the Kremlin. Then also uh, the lack of um, uh, reliable and proper infrastructure uh, in the region is uh, called as the, uh, uh, one of the threats uh, to the uh, uh, Russian national security. And um, this is also affected by the climate change because uh, the old Soviet built infrastructure uh, is collapsing now, uh, decaying now. So there is obvious need to uh, rebuild uh, the urban infrastructure, transport infrastructure, pipelines, everything, because climate change and permafrost is melting and uh, this is a real threat for the whole infrastructure. Then also uh, one uh, more important point is the environmental situation. All the document was published uh, well before the Norilsk catastrophe. Uh, it's already uh, mentioned the environmental uh, threats uh, to re the region as one of the mo most important challenges uh, to Russia's security. So in some somehow it just um, uh, uh, preempted uh, uh, the, the uh, that kind of catastrophes. And I guess it's only beginning because infrastructure is decaying, is collapsing. Uh, so there's a, a urgent need to um, uh, rebuild it, to renew it and uh, reconstruct it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So building on from that, and I suppose you briefly uh, touched upon it, what what will the, the driving forces of Moscow's policy in the Arctic be from, from now on? Yeah, um, I already uh, partially mentioned this. First of all, it's um, uh, uh, the need to solve uh, some urgent uh, socio-economic problems and environmental problems. Uh, and of course, uh, the climate change is one of the uh, driving forces of Russian uh, policies uh, in the region because it uh, has a multiple effect uh, in the region, not only in the field of environment or um, economy, uh, but also it threatens the traditional way of life of indigenous peoples and other local communities. And uh, um, it also has uh, some implications for the uh, military policies because um, uh, Russia has to change its naval strategies uh, uh, change military technologies in a sense uh, to be more efficient and uh, secure. So um, uh, climate change has uh, become a real problem uh, for uh, Russian strategists, both in, in, in the field of um, uh, social economic and environmental policies and military policies. Um, as far as the other driving forces are concerned, I would say that um, uh, there is uh, a slowly emerging uh, uh, Arctic lobby in Russia. I mean, uh, a set of um, or, or a bunch of uh, d different groups, interest groups, uh, who are really want to change uh, the Arctic policies. And uh, um, the no no northern regions of Russia are also part of this lobby because um, at the regional level, at the local level, these needs are especially felt. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, there's a disparity between different Russian regions in the Arctic. Uh, some regions like Yamal Ninets, uh, autonomous area is doing pretty well and the uh, oil and uh, gas companies, they share uh, their benefits and uh, their uh, uh, privileges uh, with, the, with the region. But other neighboring uh, uh, Arctic regions, uh, for example, like uh, Hantemansi autonomous region or Chukotka, they are in dire straits and uh, there is a lot of uh, socioeconomic and uh, ethnic problems, inter -ethnic I think religious problems in this in these areas which uh, should be solved somehow. So this is the driving forces which uh, drive Russian Arctic policy at least in the short run and the midterm uh, perspective. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we're going to move on uh, to um, the next uh, bulk of questions which concern uh, the Arctic in Russian foreign and security uh, policy, which I think, or I can see from the chat that very many people are interested in. So I'd like to turn to you first, Helge, and just ask you, what does the new out outline for the state policy until 2035 say about the development of the Arctic in an international perspective? Well, Alexander has touched upon that uh, a bit already. Uh, I think it's interesting that when 
when it talks about security uh, in this uh, document, uh, an assessment of national security in, in the Arctic, it is, as Alexander pointed out, domestic uh, challenges that are highlighted. The, the depopulation, the crumbling infrastructure, uh, the impact of the thawing permafrost, the permafrost not being permanent uh, anymore. Um, so so uh, th there's a long list of, of security concerns, but they are domestically related. And then there are also a list of challenges. Uh, and on the top of list, uh, top of that list is uh, ensuring sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, there is um, a mentioning of concern or lack, about lack of respect for international treaties. Uh, the limitation of the continental shape, shelf, such things. But, but on, on the whole, uh, I would say that this document is mostly uh, looking at uh, the domestic uh, part of the Arctic. But uh, we've seen some uh, interesting development, I think, in uh, the, the governing of the Arctic in, in recent weeks. And I would like to, to ask if, if Alexander maybe could comment on that. With um, we already had, as I mentioned, this state commission for the development of the Arctic, which is uh, an, uh, an, a structure that pool uh, business, uh, government, local government, other stakeholders in the Arctic. But now the Security Council has also announced that they will uh, establish a new commission focusing on the Arctic. Uh, and uh, in uh, in an article presenting this, it says that it will analyze the international and so so social economic situation in the Arctic zone, but also evaluate progress in development of national strategic priorities in the region and help reveal domestic and external threats to national security. So I would be curious, uh, Alexander, how you interpret this. Will this replace the existing state commission? Will the Security Council now uh, take over more responsibility for uh, Russian uh, Arctic policy? Uh, and does this imply uh, a shift towards more focus on, on security and threat uh, compared to the previous document that, that uh, had this continued emphasis on, uh, on peace and cooperation? Yeah, I think I'll just give uh, the mic to, uh, uh, to Alexander then. Should I respond to the, uh, Helga's question or the questions in the chat? I mean, uh, 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 no, you uh, you respond to uh, to Helga's questions, and I will pick up the questions in the chat. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I think that's um, uh, for Russia is not not uh, a real priority uh, uh, the securitization of the Arctic um, uh, region. Uh, uh, the messages which the Kremlin uh, sends all the time is that we want to cooperate with uh, our Arctic neighbors, and we are open for that kind of cooperation. We would not like to militarize the region. On on the contrary, we would like to uh, reduce that kind of military confrontation. And for that reason, uh, for example, uh, uh, Russia over the last uh, uh, couple of years uh, reduced the scale of military exercises in the region, especially in the Barents Sea, and didn't respond to the uh, huge military exercises which uh, NATO held uh, uh, recently, like uh, about uh, um, 50,000 uh, uh, servicemen took part in this exercise. Russia didn't respond to that, just only scheduled uh, uh, this um, routine uh, uh, exercises uh, mostly uh, on the land uh, and uh, uh, I don't see that uh, this uh, reshuffle in the managerial structure uh, signals to, towards this end that uh, uh, Russia wants more securitize the region. On the contrary, uh, finally, I guess uh, Putin himself and uh, his team, they uh, decided how to govern, how to manage the Arctic region, I mean the Russian zone of Russian Federation, and they decided to put more uh, competence and powers to the Minister of, of Foreign East and, and, and the Arctic. Uh, the State Commission became uh, a sort of coordinating body, a functional uh, 
fu functional body rather than uh, uh, decision making body. But at the same time, uh, I mean, Putin always tries to uh, introduce checks and balances in different uh, man managerial mechanisms. So he, for maybe for this reason, he decided to strengthen this component within the uh, Security Council uh, machinery, uh, which controls the, the whole decision making system. So I can explain in this way. Of course, I, I cannot explain for Putin himself, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's my guess. <laughs> Can I just uh, jump in here, um, uh, Alexander, with with a comment that I think uh, viewed from uh, the Norwegian side, uh, the uh, there has been <laughs> a very distinct uh, response, if you want to call it, um, uh, from the Russian side on the increasing uh, uh, military training activity. Uh, in the north and uh, uh, and in in the Arctic. So I'm a bit uh, um, I'm interested in how how come that kind of mismatch in in uh, perception of of the situation. Is it really so that it, uh, Russia uh, looks upon itself as not responding to that? Because here we've had you know we've had uh, Russian vehicles coming down the Norwegian coast. To, to to the mall, the coast, and uh, and the suggesting they would do military exercise uh, shootings and and so on. So, it kind of a mismatch. Can you can you comment on that? Why do you think we have this mismatch in perceptions? Maybe it's mass media is exaggerating. Uh, uh, the real uh, situation is uh, looks uh, quite different. I mean, if you look at the scale of military exercises and training uh, of uh, Russian uh, armed forces deployed to the uh, uh, Barents region or uh, in the Far East in, in, in uh, Chukotka. I mean, uh, nothing special, uh, business as usual. Uh, a number of uh, military exercises uh, going down and uh, a number of um, um, interceptions or scrambles uh, on both sides is going down in, in the Arctic uh, as compared, for example, to the 2014 to 2015 when it was the peak of uh, military activities uh, on both sides. And uh, in this situation, for example, for Russia, it looks a bit surprising and uh, disappointing that uh, NATO increased their naval activities, uh, like uh, joint exercise of, of UK and uh, US navies in May, and now which is ongoing naval exercises. This time is with the participation of Norway and uh, uh, Danish navies also involved in that uh, sense. And uh, uh, th th these uh, um, actions became more, not aggressive, but more more demanding because uh, since uh, for the first time since the Cold War period, uh, NATO navies are coming to the Russian exclusive economic zone. So uh, um, I yes. guess it's so, a mismatch, uh, mostly going like for the lack of information. Yeah, so I think I will I will put in here a question from the audience, which I think uh, represents this mismatch. So this person is asking, how do internal turbulences in Russia itself and Russian aggression in other independent states influence the behavior of Russia in the Arctic? So I will give that to you too, Alexander, since you <laughs> are based uh, in Russia. Uh, it's a, a typical misunderstanding and misinterpretation of Russian activities. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, to my mind, uh, uh, Russia um, I mean, both in the case of uh, uh, Georgian South Ossetian conflict in 2008 and uh, in the 2014, uh, in, in the case of Ukraine, uh, behaved more defensively rather than aggressively. Uh, because it's not Russia, but it was Georgia who attacked uh, Russian peacekeepers located in uh, South Ossetia. Uh, it was not Russia started a coup d'etat in Kiev. Uh, and uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, in all these cases, uh, Russia just uh, only uh, defended uh, its national interests in its uh, natural sphere of influence, as uh, many times the Russian politicians said. Uh, so uh, for us, there's no need to uh, behave aggressively in the Arctic uh, region because nobody threatens Russian position. No, nobody challenges our Russian um, uh, sovereignty or economic or any other important interest uh, in the region. And for that reason, uh, uh, the, uh, the Arctic region was bracket out from uh, the West East conflict and uh, uh, are seen both by both sides as the low intensity conflict zone. 
Thank you. I think we're going to continue a bit on this and, and bring on, in another question uh, and give it to uh, Helga. So the question is, in the last years, locals of North feel the decreased uh, decrease of business and people to people contacts and increase of military tensions. So this is their perception, right? There are increased military tensions here. How to avoid this pressure for ordinary people who live in Arctic regions when the USA uh, and China will involve Norway and Russia as an imagined battlefield? Well, I'm not sure if I have a good answer to that. Uh, as Alexander was pointing out previously, uh, the Arctic region has uh, been bracketed out and I think R Russia has uh, tried to keep it that way. It's seen uh, Russia's interests served by by keeping uh, the Arctic as a zone of, of, of peace and, and international cooperation. But um, uh, and before we had the GPARC conference, uh, GPARC project that this conference brings out of, we had the, the CANART project where we were discussing this. Is it possible in uh, a world with increased uh, great power rivalry to, to shield off the Arctic, uh, to decouple the Arctic and continue uh, uh, this uh, process of, of multilateral uh, international uh, cooperation uh, in the Arctic zone. I think we ended that project with sort of a, a split conclusion. Some of us thought that it would uh, indeed uh, be possible that there were strong drivers uh, uh, and uh, an institu institu institutionalization of this cooperation that would uh, bring it forward. Others were more pessimistic and I think if we were to rewrite the conclusions today, more of us would have become pessimistic uh, uh, when it comes to the, the possibility of uh, 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 furthering these uh, uh, positive trends in the, in the Arctic, uh, the, the uh, circumpolar Arctic. Thank you. So um, thank you. So that leads us uh, on to a topic which we also need to touch upon before our time runs out here. And that is uh, the topic of how the multilateral organizations will have, what function the multilateral uh, organizations will have, FORA will have uh, in the Arctic in the future. And uh, uh, Russia has the chairmanship, the upcoming chairmanship of the Arctic Council. So what, what role do we think that uh, the Arctic Council can play and what will Russia push for uh, uh, in this next phase? I would like to ask you uh, first Helge and then uh, Alexander. Yes, Russia will assume the, the chairmanship uh, uh, in May next year and, and have, have the chairmanship for two years. And it's still not clear what would be Russia's priorities uh, uh, as a, a chair. Um, the white paper that we have been referring to repeatedly uh, talks about the Arctic Council as a key regional institution for coordinating international cooperation. But when it comes to concrete uh, initiatives, uh, we're still waiting to hear what, what Russia will prioritize. I've tried to look at various websites of, of uh, Russian ministries and it's very little being written about uh, uh, the chairmanship so far. Uh, the, the most relevant ministry, the, the one for the development of the Far East and the Arctic, has focused on indigenous affairs and, and announced that uh, they call for an uh, indigenous summit uh, during the chairmanship. Signs have been uh, held up and um, uh, President Putin has uh, talked about uh, techn technological innovation for sustainable development. But uh, maybe Alexander can fill in with more uh, details about what the speculations are about uh, Russian priorities. Yeah. I think, uh, Alexander, why don't you do, do some thinking on what, what we uh, can expect from Russia in this uh, upcoming yeah. period? 
Yeah, uh, as uh, Helge mentioned, um, there are still no details uh, known about the um, presidential program of, of Russia in the Arctic Council. Uh, actually, we have uh, only two sources. Uh, uh, the first one was uh, Putin's speech uh, on the Arctic Forum, which was in April last year. And another one was um, uh, Lavrov's speech uh, uh, the meeting of the Arctic Council in May uh, uh, last year, the, the place where was a confrontation between uh, the United States and the rest of the Arctic Council, when uh, Mike Pompeo delivered a very aggressive uh, speech uh, before the uh, formal meeting uh, of the Arctic Council. Uh, and um, I would say that uh, uh, Helge is right that uh, Russia wants to focus on uh, functional cooperation issues, and to some extent, this is a continuation of what was uh, was proposed by uh, the Finnish chairmanship and the Icelandic uh, chairmanship. Uh, what we can expect uh, a bit new uh, from Russia, I would say that uh, Russia picked up uh, one more um, uh, issue uh, from uh, uh, the previous uh, previous presidencies, from a U.S. presidency. Uh, for example, uh, the U.S. under the Clinton administration, they wanted to provide the Arctic Council with the, with a strategic uh, vision or strategic uh, plan. Uh, which currently is lacking because uh, in the Arctic Council we don't have a strategic paper. We only have uh, uh, two year uh, presidential programs. That's it. Uh, but uh, uh, um, David Bolton, who was a uh, senior Arctic official in the in, in the Arctic Council, suggested to, to do that. And I, I think uh, that uh, Russia would try to develop that kind of uh, strategic vision for the Arctic Council during its uh, uh, presidency. Um, so I'm sorry we have a short time here and I think we need to move on and just uh, quickly address the Barents Corporation because we just heard the Norwegian Foreign Minister this morning on that. What do you think we can expect from Russia on the Barents, in the Barents Corporation? Well, we can let the, uh, Alexander go first and then Helga. I have not seen or read that kind of statement this morning. Uh, it's unavailable uh, in, in, in my uh, uh, post or on, uh, uh, internet. But I think that's uh, um, the, the first thing is uh, to start or resume cooperation in the energy sphere, which was quite a strong point in the previous uh, Norwegian-Russian cooperation before the start of the Ukrainian crisis. And also, I guess, uh, uh, the uh, resumption of uh, military to military cooperation and dialogue would be very important contribution to the building of trust uh, and uh, confidence in the region. I mean, between not only Norway and Russia, but also between NATO and, and Russia. Uh, Helge, and that actually answers uh, one of the questions here, which con concern precisely, you know, what are the prospects for uh, Russian-Norwegian cooperation in the energy sphere? Uh, but what would be your uh, answer, Helge? Well, as long as we have uh, the unresolved conflict around Ukraine, um, I guess the, 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 the prospect for resuming that, as well as the military-to-military -military cooperation, uh, are, are slim. I mean, the, uh, there is a possibility to uh, cooperate uh, in energy development onshore, but from the Russian perspective and also where we have the competence would be offshore, and that is subject to the, to the sanctions regime. That is not doesn't seem likely to to be lifted anytime soon. And then, of course, from a Norwegian side, we have been very uh, we have appreciated the people-to-people -people contacts and the possibility to move uh, more freely across the border and to, to normalize cross-border relations. But but uh, I'm not sure that both this people-to-people -people, uh, dimension of it and uh, the decentralized structure of the Barnes Europe Arctic cooperation it really fits well with the with the priorities of, of the Kremlin. Maybe Alexander can comment on that. I'm afraid that our time is running out uh, and I feel really sorry because uh, if we look in the chat here, there are really very many questions concerning uh, 
uh, military exercising and activity uh, in the Arctic. So I, I hope we can pick up on that on email or something like that, because it's obviously something that the audience is very concerned about. So there is increasing, for example, it's mentioned here, uh, could the panel comment on the ongoing US, UK, Norwegian, Danish naval exercise inside the Russian exclusive, uh, exclusive e economic zone, which is going on, I think, right now? And then another question pertaining to, would you please comment on the recent Russian Navy exercises in the Bering Sea? Uh, uh, it was reported as close to Alaska and so on. So I think we'll just have to leave it on that, that this is, uh, for the audience at least, it seems like uh, strategic tension is creeping in uh, in this very uh, cooperative uh, um, uh, area. So we will obviously be returning uh, to this in future um, conferences. So I would just like to thank the panelists uh, and the audience for participating with uh, questions and then invite you all to log on for the next panel. You can follow the link in your email if you're registered, uh, registered in advance or on the NUPI uh, webpage or simply follow the link posted on the screen when we move out now. And the next panel will be on China in Arctic politics and uh, ocean governance and it starts in exactly five minutes so you can run and get a cup of coffee and then you need to push the link again. Thank you so much uh, for following.